I'll be reading from Isaiah chapter 31. I'm going to start with the first verse. Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help, who rely on horses, who trust in the multitude of their chariots, in the great strength of their horsemen, but do not look to the Holy One of Israel or seek help from the Lord. Yet he, is, he too is wise and can bring disaster. He does not take back his words. He will rise up against the house of the wicked, against those who help evildoers. But the Egyptians are mere men and not gods. Their horses are flesh and not spirit. And when the Lord stretches out his hand, he who helps will stumble and he who helped will fall. Both will perish together. And chapter 32, verse 1, C, a king will reign in righteousness and rulers will rule with justice. Each man will be like a shelter from the wind and a refuge from the storm like streams of water in the desert and the shadow of a great rock in a thirsty land. And then the eyes of those who see will no longer be closed and the ears of those who hear will listen. The mind of the rash will know and understand and the stammering tongue will be fluent and clear. No longer will the fool be called noble nor the scoundrel be highly respected. For the fool speaks folly and his mind is busy with evil. He practices ungodliness and spreads error concerning the Lord and the hungry he leaves empty, from the thirst he withholds water. The scoundrel meth scoundrel's methods are wicked, and he makes up evil schemes to destroy the poor with lies, even when the pleas of the needy is just. But the noble man makes noble plans, and by noble deeds he stands. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the day you've given us and the opportunity to study your word. Guide us in all truth and help us to apply it in our lives. In your son's name, amen. All right. Last week, we took a look at the day of the Lord. Uh, we looked at several chapters pre uh, preceding the ones that we're going to look at today. Uh, in there, we talked about the day of the Lord. He's going to lay waste to the earth. The earth is because the earth has been defiled by its people when they broke the everlasting covenant that brought a curse. And we looked how that started back at the beginning that brought the curse when the original um, covenant uh, curse the land. He'll scatter right up to Israel, breaking the once again breaking their covenant and cursing their land. They broke it. Uh, he'll scatter the inhabitants, and they will be destroyed and burned up. He will punish those in the heavens and on the earth, not just uh, uh, on earth, but the heavens and the earth, the rulers, the ones that caused this. And the Lord Almighty will rule on Mount Zion in Jerusalem. But in spite, and this is a review. That's a review, and then we're going to go to uh, chapter 28. All right, up to 28. And in spite of this, looking at the day of the Lord, uh, we saw how it seems that Yahweh is always faithful and always in control. No matter all the turmoil that's going around and what's going on, he's always trustworthy and faithful and in control. He's a refuge and a shelter, and he saves those who trust him, removing death and grief from their presence. Uh, therefore, he said, go shut the door until his wrath is passed, making reference back to the time when God did the Passover and how he passes over, over and over again, uh, the remnant throughout history. And that day, God will deliver his people and Jacob's guilt will be removed in his sins atoned. And we looked how the term Jacob refers back to the man side of, of Jacob. And then the Israel is the spiritual side of the side that's godly. And therefore, at that time, the trumpet will sound calling his people to his holy mountain. When we looked at all this in the day of the Lord, we looked at the threefold prophecy that uh, goes with it, the near term, how it affects Judah, physically affects Israel or the remnant, Judah, and their return. We also looked how it affects uh, from a messianic standpoint, which was the time when Christ would come and establish the kingdom forever and uh, rule then. And then also in the last days, right through our time frame up until the time when the Lord will return, how the day of the Lord always follows these basic things, bringing judgment Repentance when possible, and then forgiveness and, so, and victory for those that have chosen him. 
All right, today we're going to take up from there. We're going to, uh, the bulk of the lesson is really about chapters 31 and 32 because it kind of comes down to those. But we're going to take a look at where we left off last week at the end of 27. We're going to look at chapter 28, verse 1. All right, so after he talks about the day of the Lord, it's kind of like he starts into another uh, prophecy again or another thought process. As we said, the last couple chapters, 27, 28, were actually kind of a recap of all the things that were happening in the chapters before that. So here we go to chapter 28, and mine's titled, Woe to Ephraim. Who's Ephraim? Do what? Son of who? Son of Joseph, which was the son of Jacob or Israel. And Ephraim is referred to as Israel, the northern kingdom. And uh, one thing I want to point out is, remember the southern kingdom is referred to most of the time as Judah. The northern kingdom is Israel, but that is primarily because the bulk of, of Jacob's descendants, Israel, we're in the northern kingdom. And Judah was kind of like, as it was, or if you remember when we studied day, Life of David, was kind of like the leftover one that finally came into the group of the majority. So the mo majority was being ruled primarily by the house of, of Joseph and the land and everything up there. So it was referred to as Ephraim in many cases. And it carried the title of Israel on throughout uh, the history of the divided kingdom. And Judah was pretty much the tribe of Judah. There were some others that were kind of mixed in there down there, but it's primarily Judah. So it's referred to as Judah, that tribe that's not part of Israel. Okay, so here we are. We're talking about Ephraim, which is Israel, more specifically the northern tribe. And he says here, he says, Woe to the wreath, the pride of Ephraim. What is the pride, a wreath of Ephraim? E uh, Ephraim, the pride of Ephraim. What's he referring to? What's the pride of Judah? Jerusalem. What's the pride of Ephraim? Samaria. So whenever we talk, and if you'll remember, Assyria, they talk about Nineveh. When we talk about uh, the different nations, a lot of times they refer to the capital city from where everything comes. So here, once again, he's talking about Samaria, the pride and joy and how great it is. And he goes on and uh, he says there that, uh, woe to, Ephra, to Samaria, calls it a drunkard, to the fading flower, its glorious beauty, set on the head of a fertile valley, that city, the pride of those laid low by one. He's describing this and basically he's saying that Samaria was once beautiful, but now is fading like a flower. Kind of like after the bloom is gone and it starts to die. You ever had spent all that money on roses at Valentine's Day and they sit on the counter or whatever. And then after a week or so, what do they start doing? And then they start picking the petals off or they land on the table and you have to throw them away and it just fades and fades. So a flower that's been cut is no longer alive will eventually fade and die. And that's what he's describing Samaria as. It's dead. It's not going anywhere. It's fading. It's falling away. And he goes on to tell them that uh, in the next verse, he says, See, the Lord has one who is powerful and strong and like a hailstorm and a destructive wind, like a driving rain and a flooding downpour, he will throw it forcefully to the ground. So it's basically saying, this is what's going to happen to Samaria. It's going to be destroyed with vengeance. Ever been out in a hailstorm? Yeah. I remember being out in one when we lived over here in Kimball. We had one and tried to put a car back in a shop building. As I drove over there, I got the car in the shop building so it wouldn't get beat up. When I came running back to the house, which incidentally the shop was not near, I got beat up <laughs> with hailstones. It was like, good night. Hail beats it down, destroys the crops, destroys everything it hits. And that's the destroy. And it comes suddenly and powerfully. And that's the way the Lord would come upon Samaria with vengeance and destroy it and obliterate it. Okay. Verse five and six says, in that day, the Lord will be a glorious crown, a beautiful wreath for who? 
the remnant, the remnant of his people. There's always a remnant. We've talked about this over the years and classes we've had here. God has always had a remnant. There's always some that would be faithful to him until the end, and there will always be a remnant. So he says uh, that uh, on that day, the Lord's going to be a glorious crown for those who were a remnant, those who remain trustworthy to him. Who are these people? Let's go to verse 16 for a clue. He says on that, so this is what the Lord says. See, I lay a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone for a sure foundation. The one who trusts will never be dismayed. It will make justice the measuring line and the righteous the plumb line. All right, where does God reside at this time? Samaria? Where did he reside? When they went to meet him, where did they go to meet him? Samaria? Jerusalem. He sat on the throne in Jerusalem on the Ark of the Covenant. Do what? In Zion, specifically. Yeah, in Zion. And Zion is basically the rock where the temple is or that mound where the temple is in Jerusalem, okay, in the city of Jerusalem. All right, so he's basically saying that the remnant is those that reside and follow after those that are in Zion. So here he's saying the remnant is going to be Judah. Ephraim or Israel is going to be obliterated except for the remnant. And the remnant is Judah. Judah will be uh, the remnant that will survive here. And uh, will flow to Jerusalem. The only ones that survive that will follow after God will go where God resides. If you remember back when the kingdom split, and what's the name of the two guys? Je- Jeroboam and Rehoboam. So when Rehoboam split. He was very politically wise, and so he was afraid everybody would go back to Jerusalem where God washed. Do what? Yes, correct. Yeah, Jeroboam. All right, Jeroboam thought he was smart, and so he said, whoa, we don't want him going back to Judah all the time, otherwise I'll lose my kingdom. So he set up his two alternate worship sites, and throughout the history of Israel, Ephraim, that's what they did. They went other places. They refused to go to uh, Jerusalem for worship. So here he's pointing out that the remnant will go back to worshiping where God is and resides, which is on Mount Zion. All right. So, uh, and he goes on to say that these people will be measured, and he gives a measuring line. I will make justice the measuring line and righteousness the plumb line. Why are those two words important? You're going to see them connected over and over again. When he talks about justice, what's he talk about? But more specifically, those who can't help themselves because they were the ones that were being oppressed. They were the ones that had been taken advantage of. You remember, Judah is going to be taken out because of Manassas. And Manassas, which was Hezekiah's grandfather... Manassas was so evil in the things he did, the two things that they were being going to be destro- uh, taken into captivity for was one is they took advantage of the helpless. And two, they rejected God as their leader and their king and the one that would rule their lives. So here we can see justice dealing with how they dealt with the people around them, more specifically those that they uh, disadvantaged and how they treated them. In other words, they took advantage of the disadvantaged. And there would the measuring line is going to be, okay, who's the remnant? Who's the ones that God's looking after? It's the ones who, when you measure them, were just towards those who were helpless, treated them. If you remember back to the laws of uh, 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 Leviticus, on those laws, they had provisions for the poor and how to take care of them and provide for them. But they manipulated and took advantage of them. Justice. The other one was righteousness. What does righteousness always deal with? Being right with God. Being right with God. There's no one righteous except for God. And so the, the next thing that when you start to measure is, are you one who's trying to do what God tells you to do? 
Most of these people were not. That's why only the remnant would be judged because they were just and righteous in the eyes of God. All right. He goes down to verse 21 and he tells what he's going to do to Israel. He says, the Lord will rise up as he did at Mount Perazim. Perazim. You might remember what happened there. It's in 2 Samuel somewhere. It's King David. And this is, we, when we studied David, we kind of blew through it because it's right in the middle of a chapter where a whole bunch of things, but basically at Mount, Jer- uh, whatever it is, uh, uh, David uh, demolishes the Philistines. And it says in, that ter- in, the, in the text there that God broke out against them. It wasn't so much what David did as David, remember we talked about how he consolidated and wiped out all his enemies? Well, here is, was a perfect description of how what happened. God broke out against them and demolished the Philistines. And then it was a battle after a battle after that, and it was just gone. That's the last time you read the Philistines and David, right after this chapter that this is in. So he says, all right, I'm going to break out. God's going to break out with power just like he did there. In addition to that, he goes on to say, he will rouse himself as he did in the Valley of Gibeon. You remember that? We studied that one too. What happened in the Valley of Gibeon? Joshua was in this one. That was a few more months prior to, prior to that. So it was back a day. Remember what happened in the Valley? Let me give you a hint. Why's my hand up? As long as his hand was up, the sun stood still. And God won that battle. And if you remember in that text, it talks about the fact that more were destroyed by what than sword? Hail. hail. There's that message again. There's that description of hail coming and beating them with a vengeance. Yep. It was in the valley of, uh, this valley of Gibeon right here. And, and uh, as long as, uh, he continued, uh, the sun stood still throughout the day, and there was more destroyed by that. And so the real reference here has to do with the fact that he, God did it. Not the mighty men, not the fighters, not the warriors. God obliterated them with the hail. And so he says, okay, you see these two pro- 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 uh, profound, powerful destructions that God did himself, This is what he's going to use to do his work, his strange work and perform his task, his alien task. What is a strange work and alien task he referring to? Who does, who, all right. We're talking about Ephraim and he's gonna bring judgment on Ephraim, God's people. What does God normally do for his people? Love and protect. And instead, he's going to do something really strange. He's going to obliterate them. He's going to do something that's foreign to them. He's going to obliterate them. Because that's not how God has treated his people all these years. But this is what he's going to do. And he's going to do it with the power that he did in the two examples that were given there before. And that's what Isaiah is trying to get across to them is, This is not going to be Assyria coming in and doing this. This is going to be God. And when God does it, he's going to obliterate it. All right. All right. So he's going to use that. As a matter of fact, he goes on in chapter 29 and he starts talking about Jerusalem specifically out of all this and what's going to happen there. And he says in uh, verses three through seven, as he starts talking about woe to the city of Jerusalem or David's city. Uh, And in verses three through seven, he describes how he's going to, as Corey has already talked about, what Syria is going to do to them and the city of Jerusalem as a whole. Now, when we looked at Ephraim and Israel, we need to keep in mind that he's talking about not just Ephraim, but Ju- Judah as well. He's talking about all of Jacob's descendants are going to be uh, uh, attacked and destroyed by Assyria. The remnant, the, the clause in there is going to be Jerusalem. Now, if you recall, and we've talked about this uh, in other classes, whatever, 
when Assyria destroys Israel, they also destroy most of Judah and obliterate it and, and destroy the crops and the people and the cities. They did that to the entire countryside of Judah as well. It was when they came to Jerusalem that it stopped. But until then, most of Judah was obliterated as well. And they were part of Israel and they were part of this, still part of this people who did not follow after God. But God says, I'm gonna save a remnant like he always has. And that's Jerusalem at this time. And so he goes on to describe it just like we've read in other prophecies. I will encamp against you all around and encircle you. Verse five, but your enemies will become like fine dust and suddenly in an instant, the Lord will come with thunder and earthquake and the hordes of the nations that fight against Ariel or, Jer <clears throat> or Jerusalem. Uh, it will be as if it was a dream. And we've talked about, and Corey has over the course of this class about how the whole attack on Jerusalem they surrounded the city and they besieged the city and it looked like it was imminent, but then suddenly they would all be, go back home. They would stop and return home. And we've talked about the whys and the wherefores and all that. But anyway, that's what he's making reference to in this prophecy here. He's saying all this is going to be there and then suddenly it's going to be like it was a dream or it never happened. Suddenly Jerusalem's free, you know? Nobody uh, uh, comes in. There's no fighting, no anything. It's like, uh, like a dream. It never happened. All right. <clears throat> As he goes on here, I'm going to move on to, uh, <coughs> let me see here. Uh, chapter 30, I'm going to come back to something in 29 here in just a second. But let's chapter 30, verse 1. He says, woe to the obstinate children, declares the Lord. All right. Now he's talking about Judah here as he continues on with this remnant and uh, these people that are in the, in the tribe that remains. And he says, woe to these obstinate people. I want to go back to chapter, before I get into chapter 30, I want to go back to verse 13 of the previous chapter, chapter 29, because he describes who these people are, what they are like. It says, the Lord says, these people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is made up only of rules taught by men. This is the attitude of the people. This is the obstinate children he's referring to. And as we look at that, we go back and we start looking at those obstinate children and what they're doing. That attitude says, yeah, they, they worship him. They say, yeah, he's my God. There's my temple. I worship him in the temple. And they say that, but their hearts are not there. They say things, but their heart's not there. And these obstinate people in chapter 30, verse 1, goes on to say uh, they carry out uh, plans that are not Yahweh's. Okay? And that's what Judah would do. And what's interesting we need to remember is that Hezekiah is part of this. Hezekiah trust the Lord, Hezekiah believes in the Lord. He's brought the people back closer to God, but he still won't uh, completely turn things over to God, okay? And so he and his people, it says, they carry out plans that were not his. They form an alliance, but it's not by God's spirits or God didn't have any intervention there and it causes sin to be thrown upon sin, okay? So they try to do these things without God involved, which to me is unheard of considering the fact that Hezekiah has done all these things to try to turn back to God and bring his people there, and then he still says, yeah, thank you, God. Appreciate all that you've done. Now let me figure out what I can do, okay? So we see uh, from there, it goes on in verse two and says, these, they go down to where? Egypt. Throughout this period of history in Kings and Chronicles, if you read it, you'll find them going back and forth. 
They, they needed help from Assyria to help them against their brothers to the north. Then they needed help from Egypt. Then they needed help from Assyria, Egypt, Babylon, Egypt, Babylon. All, every time one or the other came from the east or the west, they went the other side and tried to get some help. And here it says they went down to Egypt. At this time, Egypt was not even a power. Egypt had been reduced in strength to a second-rate country, nation. Assyria could outdo them in a heartbeat. But in his mind, Hezekiah's mind, he needed help. So the enemy of my enemy is my friend, is the philosophy here. Remember, he is also the one that brings the Babylonians in and shows them into the temple and everything, tries to encourage them to be on his side too which was a bad move we saw later on. So here he is with Egypt. As a matter of fact, Egypt uh, is going to kill one of his sons or grandsons. I don't remember which it was. One of the next, one of the kings in the next, they pop so fast, but in the next series or whatever, Egypt's going to end up killing one of them in a battle. But the back and forth to Egypt. Now, why is Egypt, a, in his mind, a good place to go? Horses and chariots, horses and chariots. Uh, you read down through there, it starts describing the, the, the Egypt has lots of men and horses and chariots and this powerful army. So he's looking to them. What do they know about Egypt? Specific to them as a people. It's a land of slavery. Never to go back there, never to trust in the horses and the chariots which incidentally, when Egypt tried to use those in Israel earlier on, they ended up in a muddy bog because they don't work in the mountains. They only work in the fields of Egypt. But aside from all that, they were slaves in Egypt and now they're going to them for help. Not only that, Egypt at that time was the most powerful nation on earth and as slaves, what did they do? They left Egypt and their God destroyed the most powerful nation on earth. And now you're going back to it while it's a second rate nation to save you? The point being, where was your strength then? Where should it be now? And the people don't get it. All right, so they turned to, uh, to them and uh, go, and they looked to Egypt for refuge and protection. And this relationship, it says in verse 5, will bring shame and disgrace. Going down to verse 12 through 14. Uh, no, whoop, whoop, I skipped chapters now. Where am I? Oh, no, I'm still, I'm in 30. Forgot to turn the page. All right. Verse 12. This is what the Holy One of Israel says, Yahweh, because you've rejected the message and you relied on oppression and depended upon deceit, this deceit will be like a high wall cracked and bulging that collapses suddenly in an instant. Basically he's saying because you relied on this plan of yours, you're ultimately going to fail and Jerusalem will fall. Okay. Okay. Uh, Verse 18, verse 18. After all of this, verse 17, here's what happens when the walls fall and Jerusalem fails and everything, Jerusalem is gone, which is what's going to happen when the Babylonians get there. When this takes place, he says, a thousand will flee at the threat of one and at the threat of five you'll flee away you, till you are left like a flagstaff on a mountain, like a banner on a hill. Now, there's nothing but a stick there. All right? And then he says in verse 18, Yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you. He rises to show compassion for the Lord is a God of justice and blessed are those who wait on him. <clears throat> you see, all they did was try to take things in their own hands and fix it themselves, all by myself. Faith in themselves instead of faith in God. And he's saying, in spite of all this, the Lord is there, he's compassionate 
And he wants to be gracious to you. He wants to give you good gifts. He wants to bless you. He wants to do these things for you if you'll just be patient. Isn't that something we have difficulty with? Patience? Yeah, 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 but I want it now, you know? We're all that way. So Israel was the same way. God would want to do things if you would just be gracious to them if you would just let him. Chapter 32 comes along. First of all, 31 is a recap of some of that we just read. And uh, I read the first part of it where it says, woe to those who go down to, to Egypt. So it's kind of a recap of that as it goes on to chapter 32. And when you get to 32, he says, look, a king will reign in righteousness and rulers will rule with justice. Is that what you want? Righteousness, justice, yeah. Each man will be like a shelter from the wind. All right, so the first thing is, there will be a time, it will come, it will happen that you will get a king that will reign in righteousness. You will have rulers that rule with justice. That will take place. And they will try to do what God says. And even in... Uh, a lot of times we look quickly to Christ's time and thereafter, but even in Judah's return, they tried their best to be righteous. And I meant to emphasize this last week, but we didn't. When they returned back, there was no more idol worship. They tried their hardest to follow after God and be righteous. They tried to do that. That's where the Pharisees came from. The goal of the Pharisees was a good thing. It was, we want to follow the law. We want to be like God would want us to be when his king comes back. We want to be those people. And so that's what they started off. The problem was they started adding all their extra rules to it to try to make sure that they followed that. And then before long, it became more of a a ritual instead of the heart. But the goal was when they went, and when they got back, they turned to God. They started synagogues. They started doing everything they can so that they could worship him. So this would take place. So he goes on and he says that, and he says, uh, each man will be like a shelter from the wind. So he says, each man's going to be like a shelter. It's going to be like a refuge. It's going to be like a stream of water in the desert and a shadow in a thirsty land. What do those four descriptions describe? Maybe I should say who. Who's described as the rock, the shadow that protects us, streams of living water in a desert, God, shelter, God, refuge. Who's our refuge? God. He doesn't say God here. He says each man. You see, each man that follows after this is going to be like God. He's going to try to do the things the way God would do it, and he will be able to protect others and do those things for people. They will be able to come to him instead of man taking advantage of them. Right? So they'll be like God in that those actions. Not only that, these people, their eyes... Uh, will no longer be closed. Their ears will be able to hear. Their mind will know and understand. And the babbler will be able to speak clearly. What is he saying here? What's the problem with the people in Isaiah's time? both in Israel and in, and in Judah. Lack of faith in God. They're listening to who? Anybody else. Anybody else. The fools. Goes on and starts describing the fools and how they will no longer be noble, considered noble. Instead, they'll stop listening to these fools and they'll start listening and being able to see what God has in mind and hear what he has to say and talk about God and they'll be able to... Uh, uh, rationalize and understand what God, that God is there for them. 
Instead of listening and doing all these things, the fools and their ears and everything being stopped up. As a matter of fact, Jesus uses the same discussion when he talks about parables in the New Testament, does he not? All these wise men will never understand any of these parables. Why? Because their ears are stopped, their eyes are closed. They don't have any, what, any interest in understanding. Uh, at this time... There will be a time when people will turn to God and listen to him and see him and hear him and follow him and obey him. And the fools will be seen for what they really are. No longer will the fool be called noble and the scoundrel be respected because the fool speaks folly and his mind is full of evil. He practices ungodliness. Verse eight, but the noble man, the true noble man will make noble plans and by noble deeds he will stand. In other words, he will do righteous things and good things, and he will make plans based on what God had in mind, not what they thought was the best thing to do. Okay? All right. Okay. Going on down to verse, well, first of all, there's a section there, verse 9 through 14 that describes what's going to happen to Jerusalem because of you women who are so complacent. (laughs) He uses it and describes it as the women, but it's really not just the women, folks. It's the men that are, they led their husbands. husbands. We found that from the very beginning. Gets us in trouble every time. It's a fact. Or it appears to be so anyway. Or we're going to stick with that, and that's going to be our story. The women, he's saying, are so complacent. And he uses a description of how they feel in Jerusalem that everything's comfort. They're going to have parties, and they're going to get together and do their different things, and everything's going to be just fine, like everything's okay. Where did they get that idea from? Their men. Their men are saying, we're going to Egypt and get some help. We got this covered. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. You know? So I think the main thing he's showing me is that it's everybody. It's everybody. It's, okay. He's already dealt with, with the leaders, the men, and now he's saying the women are just as corrupt. Just as, corrupt. Just as much in the, as it is. It's everybody. Good point. It hasn't changed a bit today. Hadn't changed a bit today? No. No. It, it isn't. It's everybody. And so he goes on to say this, and the fortress, and what will happen because of this, talking about Jerusalem, verse 14, the fortress will be abandoned and the noisy city deserted. Instead of partying and carrying on and all the things that are happening, all this is going to be deserted. And the citadel and watchtower become a wasteland forever, and the delight of donkeys a pasture for flocks. What happened to Jerusalem after uh, it was t- destroyed by Babylon? It was a wasteland. It literally, donkeys and everything lived in it like it was a field amongst the ruins. Beggars lived in it because there was no, nothing to live on. It was a wasteland. And so that's what he says. This great city that you all are so proud of and that you're having a party in and everything, yeah, God's going to save it for a while, but ultimately... It's going to be abandoned because it's going to be obliterated. And it describes here other places that women were having, they were offering sacrifices on their rooftops to the gods of, of the heavens, the stars, and the sun, and, the and, and even when they were called animals, they said, oh, we will continue to do this. Okay. And so God's going to call into into account. He's going to obliterate it. But, the next verse, till the Spirit is poured out upon us from high, then the desert will become a fertile field and the fertile field a forest. In other words, when this God's Spirit is poured back upon this place, then it will be revitalized. It will be brought back. And justice will take place in the desert. Remember that word? And righteousness live in the field. There will be fruit of righteousness. What's the fruit of righteousness? Peace. If you do right 
and you follow God, there is peace. People are asking for peace, 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 peace. And then they pick up their weapons and go fight a war. Where is peace? It's in doing God's will. If everybody did what God had in mind, would there be war or would there be peace? Peace. We want peace on earth? Okay. Quit picking a fight. Start living like God. You get 100% of the people doing that and there will be peace. Until that happens, there won't. That's why the Bible says there will always be wars and rumors of wars because there's always people who don't choose to serve God. As a matter of fact, we keep talking about the remnant. The majority do not follow God. So there will always be wars. All right, it goes on. He says, so the fruit of righteousness will be peace and the effect of righteousness will be quiet and confidence forever. That's what you want. Okay, they'll live in peaceful uh, dwellings, um, places. In peace, and talk about the dwelling places. Chapter eight, uh, verse eighteen. They'll be peaceful, secure, places of rest. And uh, verse twenty, uh, seed, seed will be sown by the cattle. In other words, your farming and everything will be prof. Um, bountiful is this the kind of home we all long for yeah okay and even though the hail will flatten the city and all this will take place how blessed you will be because God is there for those that are part of his people and, and that is the hopeful message to the it is that's the hopeful part absolutely and that's the thing Isaiah does over and over again is in spite of how you are, repent and turn to the Lord. Be part of the remnant. Trust in him. Do those things and God will always be there. That's what we emphasized last week that at the end of it all, no matter what happens around you and God do, deals with his wrath, be the one that he passes over. He will always be there for you. As we wrap this up, I want us to remember a lot of Isaiah talks about these prophecies or the threefold prophecies we talked about. The near term is the one specifically related to Judah and going into captivity and coming back out of captivity and all that's going to happen to Israel and uh, everything all related to that. But it also has reflection to Christ and his kingdom when he comes and defeats uh, Satan at that particular po point and establishes eternal kingdom that is prophesied about. And Isaiah is going to spend a whole lot more time talking about that later on. And, uh, and how that was going to come along and how God would bring those same peace and things to them even though he destroys that. And then ultimately the, in the last days, which is the time we're in, how God does those things and eventually he's going to bring us home to that same kind of home he describes here. That's the hope. See, that hope was to them as a people when they would come back to Jerusalem physically. That hope was seen in Christ when he established his spiritual kingdom and his spiritual Israel, and that hope was there. And then we ultimately see that hope when we know that we're going to be in heaven and live in a dwelling place where everything is peace. So as we study Isaiah, always keep in mind that he's... He's teaching and prophesying on multiple levels as he opens his mouth. Why? Because God's pretty good at doing that. All right, anything else before we uh, go on? Corey was sick today, and so hopefully he'll be back next week and go from there. All right, thank you.